These are the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds. They are the stars of the 1999 U.S. Air and Trade Show. Plus, six of the world's greatest aerobatic pilots push themselves in their planes in a unique competition. And return to the barnstorming era with the Red Baron Stearman Squadron. Fasten your seatbelt. It's all next from Dayton, Ohio. Welcome to the greatest show in the air, the United States Air and Trade Show. I'm Jim Baldridge. I'm Major General Ed Meckenbauer, United States Air Force Reserve. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Dayton, Ohio, where just 96 years ago, two young fellas taught the world how to fly. And that ushered in a romantic barnstorming era in aviation, an era honored every year here in Dayton. I've got a time machine, and I'm going to ask the crowd to join me as we go back into about 1925 or 30, because everyone knows that this is the millennium that begat the airplane. So what we're going to do is take you back to a time when the biplane was king of the sky, when all airplanes had a wing on top and a wing on the bottom. And I want the young kids to know that when they look at these outstanding jets, they're looking at the granddaddy of it all. History in the air in a couple of ways, not only remembrance of a great era, Ed, but these very planes are historic, beckoning back to the World War II days. Jim, if you're a World War II fighter pilot, you flew the Stearman, the Boeing A-75 Stearman. There were over 10,500 of these built during the Great War. Flying against a beautiful blue sky today in Dayton, and one of the beauties that of, of this particular act is that it happens up close and personal to, to the crowd. How close are we? How, what kind of box are these airplanes flying? These guys never go above about 2,000 feet above the ground, and they fly down to about 50 feet above the ground so that the crowd can see them. But interesting enough, unlike some of the other airplanes that really kind of do jitterbugs and lumbadas across the sky. Lombadas? Th yeah, these dancing elephants, you know, <laughs> never slower than zero, never more than 160 miles an hour. Up into a, well, what do you call this? Here? This is called a squirrel cage maneuver, Jim. The lead aircraft is just to kind of cutting the path through the sky and everybody else is following a little corner. Everybody does a sequential roll there when they go across the same point in the sky. Seemed like they kind of hung on their, uh, the engine torque up there just for a, a moment yeah. there. And there's a little snap Ooh, roll there and they always go to the right the same way that the engine torque you mentioned there makes the airplane. It's a lot easier to go with the torque than to fight that great big radial engine out in front of these beautiful Stearman aircraft. So unlike some aircraft, they're not flying way off airport property and above, uh, beyond the tree line, they're, they're staying right close into the crowd. The runway here is about 10,000 feet long and they never get to either end, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, up and over the top in a, a half Cuban 8, means it start doing a loop and when your nose is 45 degrees low on the back side, you roll to the right side up and then at the other end of the runway, pull right back up and into the other half of the Cuban 8, the squirrel cage Cuban 8. That smoke really shows up against this blue sky. Now this is a uh, more environmentally correct type of smoke these years, isn't it, Ed? You bet, Jim. Back in the old barnstorming days, you used to actually punch a little hole in the oil uh, reservoir, have a little calibrated <laughs> leak on a hot manifold. Nowadays, we use a thing called Corvus oil. It's very environmentally attractive, and, and after the air show, you won't have to walk away and wipe the grit off yourself. Oh, this is beautiful. Beautiful up into the gorgeous sky here in Dayton, Ohio, the birthplace, the home, and the future of aerospace. Now, what do we call the future of aerospace? Let's get a commercial in here, Ed. Okay, the future of aerospace. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is nearby, home of Aeronautical Systems Center. And really, Jim, everything that's parked on an Air Force ramp somewhere around the world was developed, bought, and is sustained now at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now, a lot of folks watching us right now trained in these airplanes. Did they uh, do this kind of stuff in the airplanes back in World War II when they were learning to fly fighter planes? Yeah, Jim, these are basic aerobatic maneuvers. Here again, we see the uh, a split S type maneuver, which is the fastest way to change your direction 180 degrees when somebody's behind you. If you're trying to shoot somebody down, the more he can move in all three dimensions, and that's what some of these maneuvers do. The Immelman, the split S, the cloverleaf, and all these other things. And now we're going to see probably something that fighter pilots didn't do. Yeah, I think so. Very few of them made hearts made in hearts the in the sky. <laughs> These are all basic aerobatic maneuvers, and whether it's the Stearmans or whether it's the, uh, the fellows who are doing some of the uh, more energetic uh, stuff in the F-14 or the A-10, or even the Thunderbirds a little later on the show, a lot of the same basic maneuvers. We just saw a loop 
Uh, upside down loop. Now, what, what, what should it feel like to be hanging up there? Open cockpit, uh, are, they, are they being pulled down or are they getting enough centrifugal force that it pulls them up? And as they go across the top here doing uh, simultaneous hammerhead turns left, no, Jim, you always keep a positive load on the airplane. Now, this airplane will get to about a minus one, which makes them a little light. It's like going over a wee bump when you're a kid in your car over one of the culverts a little bit fast. Uh, just raise you out of seat. But for the most part, these aircraft are not really aerobatic or acrobatic by their structure compared to some other things. So you'd like to keep a nice positive, no more than four positive, no more than one, so you no less than one negative. They didn't feel like they were hanging in the strands. No. They felt like they were under normal weight at the time. Yep. There. Well, still to come from the United States Air and Trade Show, the United States Air Force Thunderbirds and Sean D. Tucker. Watch him go. Stay with us. Folks, there's something really special happening in the skies of Dayton this year, only happening at three other places in the United States. It's the NAV Plus Challenge of CASPA, which is the Championship Air Show Pilots Association. This is a competition among the very top aerobatics pilots in the world for $150,000 in prize money. But there's a rub, Jim. It's not some air show official doing it. The spectators will pick the winner. I fly the America Online Extra 4.0. It's a hard charging act. We're here to win. We came to Dayton, and we're going to win the CASPA Cup. Jim. I'll tell you, you're only as good as you think you are. <laughs> Determination, pride, and some cash on the line here at Dayton. The Caspa Cup is a, a new event and uh, being welcomed by the spectators here at the United States Air and Trade Show. Jim, this is a German airplane, the Extra 300. One of the uh, aircraft was built in Europe specifically for air show competitions. And Rocky Hill's gone one step beyond here with a rather sparkle paint strip on this aircraft. Look at that. That's a partial tail slide back down. Aileron rolls as he goes back toward the, the ground and the crowd. All these aircraft, Jim, are about the same size, weigh between 12 and 1,500 pounds, got about 350 to 380 horsepower. As the America Online.com goes straight up into the air, a little oh, slide skid at there, that. out of airspeed. And this is an athletic event. They're getting bumped around there pretty good. Rocky Hill's arms are about as big as my thighs. He <laughs> is a muscular young man. Now, this is a monoplane as opposed to the biplane we saw earlier. What are the advantages of that? This is a much smaller airplane than the Stearman, too. The uh, monoplane is really a matter of uh, strength that we can do now with a lot of the composites and carbon fibers that we put on airplanes. The biplane is there mostly for structural strength, the box being a stronger thing than a cantilever. So uh, it really is a matter of what you can do now because of some of the modern technologies and construction techniques. Rocky Hill is one of six competitors today, six of the finest aerobatics pilots in the world competing here at Dayton for the CASPA Cup here, and then, what, in three other competitions throughout the, uh, the year uh, across the country. Yeah? A couple weeks ago there in Detroit, Dayton's the second stop, then they'll go up to Oshkosh, the experimental aircraft fly-in, and then up to Cleveland, Ohio for the National Air Show. Look at those. those, those that, uh, it looks like an out-of-control aileron roll of some kind. There, right? A flat 360-degree turn with aileron rolls thrown in just for confusion. Over the years, I've developed skills in my airplane that, that I alone do, and I love flying that biplane. That biplane and I are friends. I feel like I'm part of the airplane. I, when I touch it, I'm feeling the sky, and I want to share that magic with the folks at home. John D. Tucker does indeed do magic in the sky. And this magic man, Jim, was in fact the actual winner at the first Casper Roundup in Detroit a couple weeks ago. Straight up into the sky, the 10-10-220 uh, Challenger goes over on its back. It looks kind of quiet and mundane there, but look out, folks, when he starts to, there it is, a little cross-controlling snap rolls on a 45-degree down line. How many is he going to do? That's just amazing. <laughs> the things he does on an airplane are, are extraordinary, and he's, he's telling the truth. There are things he does nobody else in the world can do. Nobody else has done. Again, Jim, we look here, as opposed to Rocky Hill's monoplane, this is an older design. This is the only American design aircraft in the uh, competition. It's a variation of the traditional Pitts aircraft. He stopped going up. Man. Straight up. Now watch this, Sean. He started going down. He's going yeah. back. He's going to fly back. backwards at 120 miles an hour. That not takes a, lot of, a little coordination. Not a lot of airplanes have reverse on them. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> only Sean D. Tucker can do that. <laughs> and Jim, we're looking at the freestyle competition are actually three phases of this competition. The first phase, which is compulsory, where they're given a specific flight routine they have to do. The second style, they got three minutes. The second time, they actually got three minutes to do anything they want using smoke, using uh, music, using maneuvers to impress the, the judges. And then in the end, it's head to head. We're getting kind of a sky eye view here of Sean D. Tucker. And you talk about. This being an athletic event, and here's a guy uh, like Rocky Hill before him. This this fellow's a terrific athlete. And something else I saw him do this morning, Ed, and that is 
pace around the airplane, almost like he's flying it, walking around, uh, doing the air show, it looks like in his in his mind. Is that what's happening? Absolutely, Jim has to, well, look at it this way. He may be strapped in his seat. His seat back is full up, but his tray table is not down. This is not a time <laughs> to be reading. <laughs> he has to have this thing committed to memory. And Sean actually flies this routine three times a day to keep his physical stamina and his uh, mental awareness right on the edge. Listen, uh, 380 horses come roaring back down to the flight line there, huh? Now, he's performing also. In fact, all of the Casper pilots are performing in a very small box, and he's right down there on the ground with it, too. He's using all of it there with a right wing and a left wing and an inverted ribbon cut. The only man in the air show circuit doing a triple ribbon cut. How close is he to the ground on that? He's about 20 feet off the ground because the poles are only about 26 feet in the air, 20 feet apart. Sean D. Tucker back then across the crowd here at Dayton. Again, within 20 feet of the ground or so, and uh, look at this. And in his show, he pulls as many as 10 positive and 7.5 and negative G, so he's really being hurtled around that cockpit. Here's another trademark Sean D. Tucker maneuver. The Harrier Passer just kind of hangs it up in the propeller, about 2,800 RPM and 30, uh, 380 horses holding the airplane in the sky. Well, I'm flying this big, great Russian radial engine airplane with a huge amount of power and great vertical performance. And I just can't wait to get in there and fly against the best guys in the world. Well, that's exactly what he's doing. Casper competitor number three, Ian Groom. Ed, in a Russian plane? In a Russian plane, Jim. And the Russians in their uh, 1960s and 70s decided they were going to build an airplane that was internationally competitive. In Europe, aerobatic competitions are a big, big event. And what exactly is the uh, the type of airplane this is? This is a Sukhoi Su-31, Jim. And this airplane in a cash-strapped economy cost about a million dollars to build. That shows their commitment to uh, putting an airplane in the sky that really was a world-class aerobatic competitive aircraft. Now, Sukhoi makes fighter planes, or made fighter planes, right? so the Union, it. right? So a lot of that same technology, a lot of that same very expensive carbon fiber, titanium, a lot of those other new technology, the manufacturing technology went into making this airplane. It's a little bigger, Jim, than some of the air other airplanes in the competition, the Moudres and the uh, Extras, and it's certainly much bigger than uh, Sean Tucker's pits. But this airplane was built with a lot of power, and so wow. as Ian says, the vertical is its element. And that's sort of Ian's trademark then in the Casper competition. Absolutely. Very distinctive sound, but he does it, and he maximizes the performance of this airplane going up. Series of aileron rolls again. You know, the old torque is going around. Straight up into the sky, and... Oh, look at this. And I can't get over that sky. What a perfect day for an air show. Look at this. Okay, just about runs out of airspeed, but before losing control, flops it over on its back and comes right back down the show line. Now, Ian Groom didn't start his uh, business life as an aerobatic pilot. He started as a Wall Street banker, I understand. As a Wall Street banker, Jim, but the bug bit him. He's been flying ever since. Well, speaking of flying bug, here's a, a family affair in the air, aerobatics without the engine, as the U.S. Air and Trade Show continues from Dayton, Ohio, the birthplace of aviation. Stay with us. Jim, you know the love of flying is very often a family affair. That's so true. In fact, Bob and Patty Wagner behind us here have one of the few remaining wing walking acts in the entire world. And in the sky now is another family routine, the blue sky aerobatics. We discovered how to put one of the parachutes inverted, upside down. And then we worked at rolling the formation so the other parachute was upside down. As soon as we started doing that, we started getting more and more reaction from people on the ground because they, they were excited about watching it. It was fun to watch. And that's how we developed a show. Because we have two parachutes and we're hanging on to each other, we can fly these parachutes individual of each other. So we can put one upside down, then roll the whole formation until the other one's upside down. We do snap rolls. We do a maneuver to finish off our show we call Tornado, to where it looks like we're gonna drill ourselves all the way to China. But at the last second above the ground, we break off, and in about eight or 10 seconds, we're both standing on the ground waving at you. We were just playing around with this um, on our own. I thought it was something fun to do, and we would do it at any opportunity that we had when we were jumping with our local skydiving club at, you know, the county fair and stuff. And the reactions we got from the crowd were just so phenomenal that people started saying, you know, you really should be doing air shows.
For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and sickness and health on the top wing or in the cockpit, now we've got the Wagoners flying together. Bob and Patty are from the Dayton area, as a matter of fact, from West Milton, Ohio. But why is she up on top of that airplane, Ed? This is just one of those things that just kind of got a wild idea to go try one day, and she climbed up on the wing, and she's been doing it ever <laughs> since. They fly all over the country. In fact, they fly all over the world. And as we said, not many people do wing walking these days. No, they don't, Jim. There's only about a handful of people, literally about 10 or 11 uh, people who do wing walking at air shows all over the country. And it's... Really, one of those old barnstorming things like Jerry Van Kampen was talking about earlier. A thrilling thing to see. Is it dangerous? Not at all, really, because uh, she's holding on and she's strapped in. There's a harness on the top wing that uh, that pats into. And then over the years, she and Bob have been doing it to where they really kind of work hand in glove, so to say. And so he's not going to put her in a situation that's uncomfortable. And he knows, you know, what she's going to do up there. Having someone on top of your aircraft has got to change the way the aircraft flies, though. It does, but she's such a small lady, we'll just see. There's not much of a difference. <laughs> but really, yes, that is a big drag up there. And this aircraft is a great big old Waco. And this is an airplane that was built as a pleasure aircraft. This is not a military airplane. This is a pleasure aircraft. These Wacos were built originally in the Dayton, Ohio area right. as well. A little more of that hometown connection, Jim. Stay with us. The United States Air Force Thunderbirds are still ahead. And this B-17G called the Thunderbird is about ready to lead a whole flock of World War II aircraft across our skies. We'll be right back. Welcome back. As you can see, the Air Force always shows off its latest aircraft here at the U.S. Air and Trade Show. And with nearby Wright-Patterson Air Force Base being the birthplace, home, and future of aerospace, it's only appropriate that the first military airplane was built in Dayton, Ohio. Not exactly roaring down the runway yet, but a uh, piece of history right here. Piece of history, Jim. This is the 1911 Wright B Flyer, of which there are about 25 to 30 made right here in Dayton, Ohio, by the Wright brothers. Now, this is a replica of the original machine, updated so it passes FAA requirements. Replica in every way, except it's got a radio. It's got little identification numbers on it and strobe. And we jump up to World War II era now, the B-17 Flying Fortress. Jim, this is the queen of the skies, this B-17G, a beautiful airplane. A trail dragon bomber, champion of uh, the European War. And when it was built, they said never again would a fighter airplane fly as fast as a bomber. But looky here, Jim, Look the B-51 the Mustang. Bunch of engine on these airplanes, Ed, and these the, the, the roar of this engine is just glorious. The smooth sound of the inline engine. Ah, love that. Beautiful airplanes, powerful airplanes. And this was the airplane that uh, the silk scarves are flying out of against the uh, ME-109s and the uh, Folkwolf 190s in Germany. And this is the Lima Lima flying team. A few years after those P-51s, this uh, T-34 was an important training aircraft, Ed. Yes, in fact, the version of this aircraft is still being used by the Navy in the T-34C, but with a turboprop engine on the front. And why do these guys call themselves Lima Lima flying team, Ed? Jim, they take their name from their home drone in April, Illinois. FAA designator, Lima Lima 10. Well, this is a very different aircraft in the air, a uh, 10, an A-10, a tank killer, a flying tank, really, Ed. A flying tank, yeah, but Jim, it's got a gun in the front, ladies and gentlemen, that weighs about 4,000 pounds, is 21 feet long, and shoots about 6,000 rounds a minute, about a six inch long projectile. This thing is called a warthog. Why is that? Well, it's called a warthog because it's kind of down low and ordering around uh, looking for targets of opportunity. The official name, Jim, is the Thunderbolt II. It's a Republic aircraft built just like the P-47. But interestingly enough, the Iraqis had a better name for it. They called it the Silent Gun. This aircraft really proved itself in the Persian Gulf War and uh, in the military action recent. Ooh, look at that, in, uh, in Kosovo as well. And Major Jeff Lowry from uh, Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona is the demonstration pilot putting the A-10 through its paces here today, complete with pyrotechnic effects. Why the straight wing on this plane, Ed? Every other jet you see has swept back wings. This, Jim, this aircraft is not built for speed. This aircraft is built for maneuverability. This airplane is built for ruggedness. It's also built for ease of repair. So instead of a lot of the compound curves and fancy look and all the rest of that, the A-10 is a very functionally designed airplane. Look how the engines are kind of hidden up for the uh, infrared signature up behind the vertical and horizontal stabilizer. The straight wing gives good maneuverability as opposed to a sweep back wing, which is really built for speed. 
450 knots is about as fast as this airplane goes, but it is designed to put firepower on the target, and by Joe, it does that well. Pilots describe this as a basic and great stick and rudder airplane. What does that mean? It's a basic stick and rudder airplane, and unlike a lot of airplanes, it's tall from the root out of the tips, and this airplane goes back to some of the handling qualities familiar to a lot of our light aviation pilots. It's got a good, honest stall characteristic and a good maneuverability. And the A-10 now joined by two other aircraft for a salute to all veterans and all Americans in the Heritage flight. Major Lauer here in the A-10 in the front's got a P-51 Mustang on the right and the original Thunderbolt, the P-47 on the left wing. So much history in that picture, Ed. And if you happen to have a cup of coffee in your hand and you're the CAG on an aircraft carrier and the movie is <laughs> Top Gun, put it down because you're going to spill it on yourself. The F-14 Tomcat roars through the sky here at Dayton, Ohio at the United States Air and Trade Show. From VF-101, the Grim Reapers at NES Oceana, Lieutenant Rich Doyle and Lieutenant Greg Johnson have got this Tomcat strutting its stuff. <laughs> We're talking about uh, wings that are swept back and wings that are forward on airplanes. Now, this has really the best of both worlds, Ed, doesn't it? That it does, Jim. This has got what they call variable geometry. The wing comes forward to 20-degree sweep for these very close to the ground maneuvering uh, flight envelope that it has. But when it's put its ears back to the 68 degree sweep position, now we have minimum drag, no Patty Wagner on top of that wing, and the airplane can do two and a half times the speed of sound. But slowing down here and doing a minimum radius turn, it's amazing how much airplane there is that can turn in such a small area. Seven Gs, 325 knots, a 1,500 foot radius, Jim, what they call corner velocity. That's where he turns the most number of degrees with his nose per second. Also called the hook speed for you fighter pilots out there in the crowd. That F-14A makes another tight turn, and that's really the key to dogfighting, isn't it? The ability of a plane to turn. Absolutely, Jim. The fighter pilot likes to get behind the other guy, gives him a maximum opportunity to use his full array of weapons. Floating down the flight line here at Dayton now, that F-14 demonstrating a slow speed pass. With Got rolling. a lot of power there. He puts some Brad Whitney's to the pedal. Got 46,000 ponies shoving that airplane <laughs> up into the sky, over his back. Again, the wings forward, Jim, at 20-degree sweep for the uh, maximum maneuverability, nose low, 45 degrees, half of a Cuban 8. Watch him flip himself right side up here and down the show line. Every now and then, like right there, we see a little smoke coming off the aircraft. But that's not really smoke, is it? No, it's just water vapor, Jim. These uh, high lift wings really just squeezing a little bit of water. It's just condensation off the uh, leading edge of the wing and off the wingtips here. That's not smoke, ladies and gentlemen. That's just little wingtip vortices squeezing some water out of the air here. Two powerful engines with the afterburners twinkling very frequently during this demonstration at the U.S. Air and Trade Show. And there are two people in that aircraft, Ed. Right, you are, Jim. For air-to-air -air or fighter airplanes, traditionally in the Navy, they have a pilot in the front who flies the airplane, and the sophisticated systems are operated by the radar intercept operator in the back end. He employs the weapons. Get that condensation off the wings as we go down the flight line at Dayton, Ohio, at the U.S. Air and Trade Show. There are the afterburners twinkling on for us. Listen to that. Caspa takes to the air again. That's Mike Goulian. The aerobatics competition at Dayton, Ohio. Stay with us. The U.S. Air and Trade Show returns after this. I come from a heavy competition background, so you're going to see a lot of very precise competition-oriented uh, aerobatics uh, in my flying today. Matt Chapman and Caspa back in the air at the U.S. Air and Trade Show in Dayton, Ohio. Dayton's one of four stops of the Caspa competition. Air shows around the country this year for $150,000 in prizes the top aerobatics pilots in the world are competing in. Less than 50 people, Jim, in the world have got the FAA certification level one to fly essentially zero altitude down to the ground in their maneuvering. Very, very stringent qualification to be allowed to even participate in something like this. And the amazing thing about CASPA is it's not some uh, judge somewhere who is an expert aerobatic pilot himself or herself who are evaluating these people. It's the crowd. Look at that. Wow. Casper is a brainchild of uh, Chuck Newcomb, who puts on the air show here in Dayton. And it was, the idea was, let's let these people go out and be showmen. 
Let's let them use smoke, let them use music, let them use anything they want in their imagination, rather than say, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Now, there are three phases to the competition. The first one is a compulsory, where they have to do predetermined, pre-prescribed maneuvers, and each guy is judged on how well he does that maneuver. The second one is a freestyle, three or four minutes, depending on the venue, to go out and do anything they want. That's where you see the unique capabilities of each aircraft, the unique ideas of each pilot. And then finally, at the end of the show, we'll see the head-to-head -head with the winners of the compulsory and the freestyle go head-to-head. -head. Matt Chaplin is the fourth Caswell competitor we've seen. What kind of airplane is this? This is a French 231 Madre Cap 231EX. Another one of those airplanes, Jim, built specifically for aerobatic competitions. And we're getting a sky-eye view of the Caswell competition in Dayton. Matt's an interesting guy. He likes cheeseburgers anytime, any place. <laughs> Of course, and flying is a love. I bet he didn't just have cheeseburgers before doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the pilots that bring a competition background to the air show business as well. So my flying will probably be a little bit more on the uh, crisper side, aggressive side, a little bit more um, oh, precise, if you will. And then we take that and throw in a bunch of tumbles to bring it to the air show side. So hopefully the spectators will see something a little bit different. Mike Goulian is our fifth competitor here in Dayton at the U.S. Air and Trade Show in a what looks like a similar airplane uh, to Matt Chapman's. Jim, this is a, also a Moudre cap airplane, a 232, slightly different versus Matt Chapman's 330 horsepower. Mike has only got 300 horsepower in this particular aircraft, but again, you know, he's a he's a pretty doggone capable guy. He was in 1993 a silver medalist at the Unlimited, the highest ranking male pilot in the world competition. 1992, the same thing, and this competition uh, has just been getting better and better. 1998, a silver team medallion in the World Aerobatic Championships. And what we're seeing, I think, in the Casper competition, because it's judged by spectators and not by air show judges, is a lot more rolls and turns and twists and exciting things just like that. What? what Lomschewax. It's a cross control where he just kind of puts a stick in one corner, the other in the other, and just kind of tumbles head over heels. Lomschewax being a Czechoslovakian word for headache. And you can imagine why. Okay, down the show line and back up in the sky. And as Mike said, he likes these crisp maneuvers. You see the competition in him still coming out. And again, all this is happening in a very small space with these aerobatics com competitors. About 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters high, 3,000 feet cube in uh, international uh, parlance there. That's what they do when they do things like the Breitling Cup, which is the world uh, competition for aerobatic pilots. And Mike, it's down how low? These guys are all ace level one, as I said. They can go down to the ground. So to today the they're jacking it up just a little bit so people beyond the first row can see how spectacular some of their maneuvers are. Now that is a completely out of control maneuver, at least the maneuver itself temporarily. He's never really out of control because he knows what he's doing. But how do you regain control in a situation like that? The plane flipped around and, and over. Yeah, these airplanes, Jim, are built with uh, the heavy end, like a lawn dart. The heavy end's in the front, so uh, there's a predictable outcome to all the unpredictable maneuvers. You just have to know where to do it and have the time to recover from it. That's course. right. Upside down, down the show line, a few aileron rolls. Again, letting the torque of the engine help the airplane roll left. Very few rolls to the right when you got the big power out in front there trying to make you go left. Once more, predictably left. And now Ooh, there look he is, a little, look a little skid with a rudder and then a uh, little Lamschewak across the top. A couple of them there. We're trying to make it look dynamic to the crowd, so we really cut loose. You know, all the high Gs, high roll rate, uh, a lot of snap rolls. Pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool is right. Another real air show personality, Ed, Gene Susie. Well, Gene is probably the granddaddy of this crowd. He's been flying since 1968 in air shows. Mike Gullion's the baby. He's only been flying since 1986. <laughs> since 1968, Mr. Air Show, Gene Susie has been a mainstay in many forms in the air show circuit, having flown for 25 years with the Eagles. The Christian Eagles. Uh broke up just, what, two years ago? Two years, three years ago. Yep. Yeah. And now he's flying an extra 300, sponsored by an insurance company. Might seem like an oxymoron there, but obviously they have great confidence in his ability. Many, many times uh, a world and national aerobatic champion, and obviously some guy who is very, very familiar with this element called air show flying. Ooh, that's pretty. A little skid there going up, a little wiggle of the tail, say hello to people across the top. 300 horsepower in this German-designed airplane, upside down, low-speed wing rock. 
And again, right in front of the crowd. Everything happens right in front of the crowd. A very small show box for these CASPA aerobatics competitors. And again, Jim, these people are pulling out all the stops. This is the freestyle competition where they're really trying to make people on the ground get enthused about what they see that airplane doing in the sky right in front of them. Now, we've been saying the spectators choose the winner. Mm -hmm. Actually, representatives of the spectators are, uh, what, 10 or, or so? Uh, about 10 people, people are out of the here. crowd, maybe a couple of local newspaper personalities, television personalities, but for the most part, it's the crowd. And there is an element of uh, the voting called just applause. They got an applause meter out there, and the guy who wins the most by noise and the smacking of the hands together gets a certain uh, number of points. So this is this is basically, well, this is totally showmanship. Crowd appeal, you bet. Right up into the sky now. He's got the airplane just hanging on a propeller. He's going to try to fly her backwards a little bit, then backwards tumble the over. Out of that smoke will come Gene Susie heading down. One of the greatest uh, skies we've had at Dayton in what 25 years that this show has been on uh, exists today the united states air and trade show well there it is in the hands he prophesied it rocky hill won the dayton cup and thanks to all our competitors at the united states air and trade show in dayton the thunderbirds are getting ready to roll stay with us much more to come Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and now we're just minutes away from the flying of the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. You know, being a Thunderbird officer or enlisted isn't easy, and being Thunderbird family isn't easy either. That's right, Jim. You know, we may hire an individual into the military, but we really take on a family. It's the weekly homecoming for the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. Most Thursdays, about 60 Thunderbirds, half the team, fly off to a show site. Most Mondays, they return to their squadron mates and families. It's hard on everybody on the team with, with the family. It's hard on everybody. Um, the kids don't like it when daddy's away, you know. Every week when that C-141 Starlifter carries members of the Thunderbirds back from Dayton or from any of the other dozens of show sites, it's a very special reunion time for Thunderbirds families. When the kids really miss him, it's hard to kind of keep them happy and kind of keep them, you know, waiting a little bit, telling them dad's coming home soon. Daddy is Staff Sergeant Doug Spaltrow, an 11-year Air Force veteran and the assistant crew chief of Thunderbird Jet No. 5. His job is to keep that F-16 ready to fly and perform wherever in the world it goes. To this reunion, Lori Spaltrow brought only three-and-a-half-year-old Dominic. Most weeks, she also brings Dominic's two older sisters. They're part of a crowd of family members outside the Thunderbirds headquarters hangar to welcome their men and women back home. It's great coming home, you know. It's always great being on the road and meeting all the great people there, but it's just as great coming home to my family. So. Great to be home, but don't get used to it. Most will be home for just three regular work days, then they're off to another air show. Most Thunderbirds, officers and enlisted, spend 200 to 250 days and nights a year on the road. Even for younger and single people, travel like that can be agonizing. Only the Thunderbirds pilots get to fly to and from shows in those fast red, white, and blue fighter jets. Everyone else sits in the back of a cargo plane. But just as Thunderbirds' flying skills are a stepped-up reflection of the skills of every Air Force fighter pilot, Thunderbirds' family separations are sort of an extreme version of the separations every Air Force family experiences. And most career Air Force people pull at least one long assignment where family members cannot go. Doug Spaltrow served time in some faraway places in the Air Force, but ah, those reunions. We just always try to have a surprise for him. The house is always clean, and the dog's always excited. <laughs> we kind of get her going, Daddy's coming home. And we just really gear up for it. We just know that Mondays are our, are our time. Unless he's been gone for a long time, then, you know, Mondays are real special. Let's meet the Thunderbirds in reverse order as they peel off to their aircraft. Number six, the opposing solo, Major Dean Wright, a 1987 Air Force Academy graduate. With the number five upside down on his airplane is the lead solo, a 1986 Academy graduate in his second year, Major Dennis Malfer. Number four, riding slot, a graduate of Clemson University, Major Scott C. Bowen. The right wing in his third year on the team from the Air Force Academy class of 87, Major Mark Arlinghouse. Also from 87, Yusafa class. In his second year, left wing, Major Bradley Bartels. And the leader, the boss of the 1999 Thunderbirds, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Bishop, a 1983 Air Force Academy graduate with 3,100 hours flying the F-16 and T-37. Get your copy of the 1998 or 1999 U.S. Air and Trade Show. Call 800-570-5258 or on the web at whiotv.com.
And the 1999 United States Air Force Thunderbirds are in the air at Dayton at the United States Air and Trade Show. Jim, for 46 years, the Thunderbirds have been our most visible ambassadors for the United States Air Force, thrilling crowds all over the world. And here's our beautiful picture of the F-16 Fighting Falcon in beautiful paint sky. There they go. The opposing solos number five and six. Aileron rolls at show center. Always something happening in front of the crowd with the Thunderbirds between the soloists performing, alternating with the uh, four-ship diamond in this case. Uh, always something going on. Always a great, great show. There's a beautiful maneuver, a transition from the in-trail to the traditional diamond as the Thunderbirds do a pass and review. Beautifully maneuverable aircraft, Jim. And this is the ballroom side, Jimmy. We got the uh, four guys here. You just kind of put that to a little Blue Danube music here. Meanwhile, number five upside down, down the flight line, showing the handling characteristics of this airplane in any attitude. You talked about maneuverability. How does this compare to the F-14 that we saw earlier, the Navy plane? Much more agile, Jim, only because it's a little bit smaller by about, uh, it's only about two thirds the size of the F-14. And this airplane was built originally as an air combat fighter, so it has a very mission adaptive wing in other words the wing changes its shape as whereas the f-14 has a swing wing the shape on this wing changes to achieve optimum maneuverability now this is one engine one pilot and a single engine single seat and these fellas now are only 36 inches apart wing tip to wing tip passing with you beautiful photo pass and the crowd loves it here at dayton ohio a nice knife edge pass. You don't normally think about airplanes flying on their side, but a good shot of the uh, Thunderbird on the bottom of number six as it goes down the show line. And back up into that beautiful sky at Dayton, Ohio. A little aileron roll to punctuate the maneuver. Yeah, it makes it a little more fun than just going straight and level. Again, now we have solo aircraft coming in. A nice slow roll. Airplanes are just very, very controllable with a lot of the electronic flight control systems we have in the solo. Now, how high above the ground was he when he did that roll in? They're about 300 feet above the ground, the solos, when they come down the show line. Okay, now we got a little loose formation here, it looks like, as the Thunderbird Diamond pulls up, and it's not really loose at all. They've moved all the way out, folks, to probably about four or five feet instead of the three feet we saw in the passing review. An aileron roll. Somebody just gets to roll over in bed. The other guy's on the wing. Three, <laughs> and, uh, two have got to get out, get out of bed, go on the other side, and back up the other side. Well, they're rolling. The, the airplanes are rolling while the whole formation is rolling. That's right. So that's a very complicated maneuver, I would expect. And again, now we got a little precise movement here. We got ourselves a eight-point roll, stopping at each of the cardinal points, plus 45 degrees on the aileron roll. Eight-point hesitation roll. Jim, these F-16Cs have got a Pratt & Whitney engine and puts out about 24,000 pounds of thrust, and the airplanes only weigh about 22,000 pounds in the show configuration. So in theory, they could go up there and join the shuttle. <laughs> well, how fast will this airplane go? This is a Mach 2 Plus airplane. It'll go about 2.2, 2.3, 2.2, or 2.3 times the speed of sound. Now, you mentioned this is uh, designed as an air-to-air -air fighter, but it actually does more than that now, doesn't it? It was. It was designed originally as an air combat fighter, then it turned into a multi-role fighter, as you see them climbing up in the sky here in an arrowhead formation. The airplane has actually grown an awful lot. It was originally supposed to be a low-end complement to the F-15, which was a very sophisticated, much larger airplane. And the air combat fighter thing gave way to a multi-role fighter, and now we find that this airplane is the premier equipment and Air Force fighter squadrons, and Ooh, indeed, look at 20 that. Air Forces around the world at 80 different bases fly variations of the F-16, and it does air-to-air, -air, and it does air-to-ground, and it does them both very well as we look at the tail end of the Arrowhead loop. Awfully pretty pictures. A little Calypso pass here, one side up, one side down, five and six down the flight line. On his back for a long time, Ed. Is that a, a normal uh, ability of this airplane? Any airplane can fly upside down for some period of time, generally 10 to 15 seconds as an inverted fuel reservoir. Might be a slight modification. Here's a little loose formation, but they got the little uh, little extra room for reason because... Oh, that's good. Bon ton relay, let the good times roll. Now, you, any fighter pilot can do these basic maneuvers, is that correct, Ed? But probably not anyone can just jump into the Thunderbirds and say, I'm flying with you guys today, right? As the Thunderbirds are quick oh, to tell you, yeah. there you go, it just meant. As the Thunderbirds will tell you, they are doing maneuvers that any Air Force fighter pilot can do. It's just that the Thunderbirds do them a little closer to the ground, 
They do them a little closer together, and they do them a lot more often, and that turns into efficiency and skill and a real team effort. The Thunderbird pilots normally have a two-year tour of duty with the team, and I think the same is true uh, two or three years in the case of enlisted people. Every now and then we'll get a third-year pilot. Every now and then you get a third-year pilot, and the narrator does one year as a narrator, then he moves into the sixth flying thing. And Jimmy talked about the team. For the enlisted people, it's a three-year tour, and they are every much as Thunderbird as these uh, six gentlemen who have the privilege and the honor of flying uh, in the F-16. And these six gentlemen will be the first to tell you that very thing. As they have 30 Thunderbirds. <laughs> <laughs> you cross the sky here in a nice big, uh, like a clover loop there in a diamond formation. Great margin of safety. This airplane has got so much capability, Jim. Generally, they're operating only about the 85% of the thrust available, and they're operating uh, probably about uh, 80 to 85% of the maneuverability available. And here's a good demonstration of a slow speed pass, about 120 knots in a landing configuration, just showing that this airplane is still very safe, very stable, even at a relatively low speed. 120 knots translates into what miles per hour? That's about 140 miles an hour. It's 15% more. When you go from knots to miles per hour, you add 15%, just like a tip. Now the whole, oh, the whole formation there, the, the four-ship diamond doing the slow speed pass, and we saw a fast speed pass. <laughs> high speed <laughs> pass, showing us. the contrast and capability <laughs> of the airplane. It's fast speed pass. The interesting okay. thing about that is you know, the timing has to be just perfect, as in all these maneuvers, Jim, to have things happen at exactly show center. Now the Fighting Falcon in a minimum radius turn. Eight to nine Gs, Jim, sustained 425 knots, the corner velocity or hook speed we talked about earlier, the Fighting Falcon. 1500 foot radius a flat 360 degree turn that's quick compressing the air look at that about one third of the lift of this airplane comes not off the wings but off the fuselage you get a hmm. look good look there about how he's getting lift off the fuselage off the four body strikes there what's he feeling at this point what's he's, the pilot feeling he's yeah. feeling about four or five g's right there going across the top of that loop okay we got the diamond coming back in again. beautiful close formation again. these guys are going to do a minimum radius turn but a little more relaxed it's a little tougher to sustain eight or nine G's when you do a minimum radius turn. Okay, the opposing so solos again. And down the flight line to each side, up into a high loop. No, a corkscrew climb is what we're seeing there, up into the sun. I told you I had a thrust to weight ratio of greater than one. They're going up to the That's moon right. or the sun That's or something right. there. Now we've got all six ships together. And this is a big oh, delta look loop. Look at this, Jim. We got uh, really some fantastic three-dimensional flying here as the uh, big six ship does a nice slow roll right across show center. Deceiving because this is a very complicated maneuver to do. Yes, sir, it is because, again, you know, the guys on the outside, five and six, not only have they been flying by themselves, been really aggressive, got their ears laid back, now they have to come back in and do a little slower, more genteel type flying, but at the same time, it's very demanding to hold an exact position when you're on the outrigger of a maneuver like that. At the top, the two soloists split off. The four ship diamond together. Isn't that beautiful? Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Air Force Thunderbirds above the birthplace of aviation, Dayton, Ohio, the United States Air and Trade Show. Well, Ed, the 25th United States Air and Trade Show comes to a close. Jim, that means it's time to do the pre-flight, pull the chalks, and fly home. Dayton, of course, is the home of aviation, and you're invited back again next year to the city to top the world of flying. I'm Jim Baldridge. And I'm Ed Meckenbeyer. Thanks for being with us. So long.